this, um, this is my first project I ever did. I, I was um, an avid bicyclist in my early, early teens. I was a paperboy and a bicyclist. And uh, I managed to get hooked up with a, a shop then in Rochelle Park. And cycling kind of led, I always wanted to have some place to go. So I used to go to bookshops. At that time, there were, even in the suburbs, there were a number of antique bookshops. And I loved the way the books looked, just the leather binding. So I'd buy those and weigh them for some reason. And uh, uh, I just keep records of the weight of books. And then I started reading, um, I, I read the, the one, um, The Spectator, you know, Steele and Allison, and, and it just changed my life. I, I suddenly, I got involved in sort of this British-y thing. Uh, and then at Fuji, I said, you know, your, your um, logo doesn't look good. And, and, and they said, well, what do you want to do about that? At that time, I picked up a book which amazed me. It totally amazed me. It was published in 1971. I know probably many of you have seen it. Graphic Designers in the USA. And it was volume two. So it had uh, Rudy DeHarrick in it, Shemaya and Geismer, and others. So Paul Davis was in that issue as well. And I remember looking at Rudy DeHarrick's work and just being shocked, amazed that something could look like that. So uh, I was 15 years old. I did the Fuji logo. And they paid me $500 which was great because I was only making 13 a week as a paper boy, so it was half a year's salary. So that, that's always been my target. If I could do a logo for half a year's salary, that's good. So I sort of stuck with that. But I, uh, uh, as you can see, I based it on Garment. And, um, but, uh, what, what, yeah, uh, too short. And um, what I realized is I could kind of follow the fewer two more closely, or I could modify it. This. And that began the problem, right? It's always this problem of trade off. And I, I knew there was something wrong about this, but something I liked about that single line. And I kind of submitted both versions to them. And I remember at that point that very much, you know, design is sort of like putting two people who hate each other together and producing a beautiful child, right? It's always this, <laughs> this challenge of, uh, of balance. So right away I learned that. I love the fact that I had the bicycle wheels and stuff. And it, the, the duality. So that was it. And um, I haven't done anything really great since then. And now I'm going to jump ahead 37 years um, to, to our theories. Now, basically, I, I find that so much of design is this process of categorizing things, right? developing taxonomies. And uh, designers, when they do taxonomies, also deal with the visualization part, which I think is tremendously enjoyable. So... I sort of break it into three categories, the taxonomy, how you divide things into categories, and then the ontology, uh, which is really how you describe those categories. So the description is, is very critical, uh, and then the manifestation, like what you want to make that look like. I I've, I've very much feel that the classification of typography is, is really quite atrocious because the ontologies are all over the map. Some are historical, some are by form, some are by use. So really, even when I teach typography now to students, I really do downplay classification. I try, we try to see it from any single line, either through, um, either through the idea of uh, form or through history. Um, sometimes, you know, technology absolutely has a major effect on that. So from the form itself, we generally look at four vectors right away, which I, I call the, the sort of typographic literacy or, uh, as the first vector. And then the other ones really deal with the form and uh, characters next to each other. Uh, and then finally, characters on a line length. And that's something I want to have a little fun with today, uh, the, the line length, the ideal line length. Uh, all of us have seen various treatises by um, persons about legibility. You know, John Ryder's comes to mind, A Case for Legibility, great little book. And of course, it's 39 char his, his text is set at 39 characters to the line. Right? Remember, it's an alphabet and a half. And I remember when I was taught, the ideal measure was an alphabet and a half. I never knew why people would just say 39. It's like saying, you know, don't lift more than 100 divided by 2 pounds. And you go, <laughs> that would be 50. Yes, but we prefer to say 100 divided by 2. Right? So I was looking at um, that aspect, and that's the, where the four poetic pieces come into this. So there's actually two lectures that weave into each other in a very uh, disorganized manner. So in information design, we began to work, or I should say we continued to work on this uh, taxonomy. I had started it many uh, years before. In Cooper Union, I began to try to see if there was a way to teach students 
to look at information in these kind of layered ways and see if there was one sort of key way to, to understand that. And uh, I guess probably be, began that in the, in the mid-'80s, I guess. Um, and it wasn't really until uh, 2005 or 2006 that we sort of finally delivered this to the government. I actually got a one million, spent it all, but I got a $1 million grant. We looked at tens of thousands of images and tried to see if we could break the theory. And again, I don't think it's too critical that we all have to you know, learn this theory per se, but it's very simple logic in it. And what it's done uh, for me is, is allowed in teaching students, I find that within weeks instead of months, that you already are producing really beautiful work in terms of its intelligence and its uh, formulation and its communicative abilities. And then we can spend the rest of the semester doing the stuff that really matters, all that fine-tuning, which was always difficult before. Uh, so basically, the very simple model begins with this concept of content being rendered through some sort of engine uh, and resulting in a representation. So that, that's everything. You, know, it's, you just put everything in that little pile. Uh, I've got my glasses. I actually have to look at the same slide you do because I can't see this one. Um, so design, technology, perception, cultural in interpretations, everything. So every time you take that invisible content, run it through the thinking, uh, the algorithms, the logic, the pleasures, the passions, and creating something that looks like something. And I do make a slight break between what I call informative imagery and expressive imagery. I think I'll get to that as we go through. Um, so from there, I sort of looked at this other idea that almost every image there is has a, a similitude in its base map, has some organizing underlying principle uh, that sometimes is seen. It's almost always seen in scientific work where you have like Cartesian graphs and points like this. But it's only sometimes seen in most of our other work. But of course, the superficies, which means the stuff that's seen, is seen. So that would make sense, right? Um, but here comes the fun. It's so easy to remember this. This is part of the pleasure. You know, when you develop some system and you spend like years and years and then you're able to explain it not only in an elevator pitch but between like the third and ninth floor, right? Or just a couple floors. It's great, you know? And you know it will take about 16 years to unfold the whole thing. But it's just PQRS. So the first classification is pictorial. And uh, so you have a pictorial classification. I'm going to go back and forth here. A quantitative classification, a relational classification, and our friends, the symbolic classification, place, type, here. Um, <clears throat> so <coughs> then it gets a little, slightly more confusing, but not too much more, um, in that there seem to be then these opportunities of how these maps work together. So one can have a pictorial uh, situation where everything is absolutely in orientation to itself, as you would get with a high-quality photograph um, would be a good, good example, or any image that would probably be captured by uh, waves of some kind. Or you could just do a sketch or caricature of someone, and that would be a picture, but would, what I'd call low constraint. So you have this high and low constraint uh, act, uh, opportunities in this world. Um, same thing here. In the quantitative, you've, you've got uh, your Cartesian points. Or I can just basically say the big dot's 10, uh, the middle dot's 7, and the little dot's 3. I, I can assign uh, information to it. And in relational, a similar thing happens. You have a system of cells where the cells all relate to each other in some manner, columns and rows, basically a database structure. And again, because we're humans, we might have a lot of material that we want to pile in some cells in the corner and no material for most of the cells so we also have the system of nodes and links. So we can basically move all our information around uh, spatially. We can kind of reorganize it. But again, you see what has to happen. You need the links. Because now if I move all my dots around and I don't link them, you don't know how the cells relate. So that's, that's your, uh, your third there. And then within the symbolic, you um, have really two classes. You have the ones um, which I mentioned in the title of, of our slide the constrained symbols. And those are just uh, symbols that have to be placed into some order in order to convey meaning. Or you can have a symbol that actually has meaning conveyed into it culturally um, or through other processes uh, such as an ideogram or a pictogram or a logo. 
uh, and that is unconstrained because wherever I move that logo, its meaning is carried with it. And that's it. Those are the eight. Everything's done with those eight. So that was the argument. Um, I drank so much scotch getting through the process of trying to prove this, and we came pretty close. So, again, this is just another way to look at the same thing. High constraint, low constraint, high constraint, low constraint, high and low again. Uh, you'll notice this is a, a node link diagram. It's actually a, um, for a number of years, I've restored Jaguars. I mean, you always have to do something else to mess up your deadlines, right? You always have to have some hobby to make sure that, you know, your deadline is really pushed to the absolute maximum. <laughs> so, um, and restoring cars is like one of the best ways to lose money that I ever came up with. <laughs> My brother is much better at it than I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. And uh, so... I, I, you know, then I went off and I learned all the, co the British color coding system of their wiring systems and started, of course, to collect the manuals, which eventually I kept and I got rid of all the cars, which is really good because the government doesn't need, you don't have to actually have titles for the manuals uh, or pay insurance or any of those things. And, uh, and they haven't nationalized collecting manuals yet, so maybe soon. Um, so this is the other version. You're, um, I go all over with politics, so just be ready for that. Um, so you basically, you know, all these cells are organized according to a system wherever I put the dot, it has meaning. Uh, there, where I put the dots where they can fit, and then I assign meaning later. So, um, and the last one, symbolic, uh, you might know this dude here, this little Gutenberg thing. And uh, he arranged all the characters, you know, in order to convey meaning. And obviously he followed the templates of the time. So... Uh, again, okay, then we did, okay, so this is where the real fun began, and please try to just forget this as soon as I show it to you. I just want to prove that we did it, uh, and we justified the taxpayer money. That's really the point of this here. Um, but what we did is, the idea was to see if you could take any data set at all, and run it through the system to generate the type of image you want. So I could look at information as a line of text, I could look at information in some sort of um, node and link system, I could move it around that way. So to do that, you would need the algorithms that allow that. So we came up with a, um, a system that basically uh, says whether the thing is on the surface or below the surface, whether it's organizing the data or whether it's being organized by the underlying uh, grid, the matrix. The whole just means it's, it's high constraint. So basically high constraint, superface, uh, high constraint, base map. I, uh, low constraint, base map, low constraint, superface. So this little iconographic system uh, allowed us to sort of have a way of communicating this. So when I walk around the city and see things, this is what I see now. You know, I look at a, I look at a billboard and I see a bunch of triangles in different colors. I, I've actually trained myself to do that. It's really nice because then I don't see any bad typography. I just say, that is typography, and I'm happy. I'm very happy with that. Um, so... We, and then we did a little kind of a, a mnemic, you know, for the colors. Um, this is, because it's real picture, the green was sort of natural. Any cognitive psychologists here? Okay, I'm good. Um, and then the, the, the yellow is warning, so get your facts right, quantitative. Uh, the red is relational, blood, red relations, that kind of remembered. And then, of course, all typography is black, right? So that allowed us to, to solve that problem. Except when it's not, but, you know, that's one of those issues. So now I just want to run through some of these because the point is really to get to the fact that what was discovered in almost all the informative, uh, truly informative material, you always get back to typography. You always get back to this linear stuff. You make it as spatial as you want to bring as much data to the users as possible, but somehow the last mile is always this little line. And um, we found that over and over. So usually when we began to uh, create the iconographic systems, these, you know, these black typographic things happened all the time. And then there's another problem with type, which is, you know, our books aren't infinitely long and a half inch tall, right? So we have to have this way of breaking these lines up. And the breaking up of lines is, I think, really one of the most critical aspects of working with type. And so I got involved in this idea of 39 characters. Like, why is it, um, you know, one and a half alphabets? And I'm going to break into that a little bit. And I'm not going to show you all 700 images. We're just going to skip through a couple, okay? Shoot, that was supposed to be funny. Okay, never mind. Uh, I'll show you all 700 images, okay? So here, for example, 
there's really no base map here, right? Um, there's nothing uh, orientating this, this drawing. By the way, it's done by Arno Klein's brother, who is he's all, or he's an identical twin to Arno, so it's just everything is humorous about that family, but they're just amazing people, and his craftsmanship is incredible. And um, so you can see this is not high constraint, because you'd say to yourself, well, it's a very precise image. Why isn't it high constraint? But it's not high constraint because it's really a fanciful image. It's, it's showing the fly in a way that you really never see it in this perfect profile. So sometimes the low constraint is actually more precise looking. So there's kind of rules about that. And you can also see there's no, there's no base map. It's just place over nothing. Um, so that's a very precision picture of that type. Charlie will know this image. Um, I got permission. And um, this, is a, this is, you basically have the whole system here. This is basically an image. So an image is a screen thing. Another reason this was interesting, uh, a value to government, is they were trying to sort through millions of images. And how do you do that? Like, what is an image? What is an informative image? How do you classify it? So that's where that VTCAD comes in, classification part. So um, as it builds up, and then there's also a, a linguistic, we needed this too, but... I'm not going to go into that now. So it gets confusing pretty fast, right? Um, but, but basically what you have is you have, a, um, no, you have a base map, which is an image, right? The bus, which is a highly distorted bus, um, but it's still a bus. And it's been distorted so we understand more about it. And this is something that typography has a very different way of handling. Uh, one of the exciting things when working in our labs was we were, we, our specialty was basically making images that didn't look like the real thing, that conveyed more information about the real thing than the real thing would, right? So we had this idea of, we called it cognitive gain. We could never come up with a better term at that time, but as opposed to sort of accuracy gain, um, it was cognitive gain, that you, you learn more from a distorted image than you would from an accurate image. Um, but basically what you're seeing here is the image is supporting this other system. It's supporting icons, um, it's supporting little pictures, um, and it's supporting these little blocks of text. So this is actually a block of text because it's both a line, but it also has a return. It has, it's, it's in its own relational device. And then finally on top of that is the color-coded system. So that's basically what that means. And believe it or not, when I keep looking at these things, I know what the, I know what the art looks like. So it gets kind of bizarre after a while, but it's fun. Um, here you actually have a high constraint image that doesn't have a base map. It's high constraint because it's very carefully articulated unto itself. This is a Trek bicycle frame, nicely drawn. And um, again, you have typography and you have, kind of interesting, you have quantitative devices which are determining the distances. So you actually have a quantitative device which is supporting typography. So everything runs down to the back. The system actually reads, I think it's the only language that does, it reads from bottom up and from left to right. So it reads out from the corner, which I just wanted to do something different there. You know? But <laughs> if you reverse it, it's really hard to use, though. You know, this way it always sits down at the bottom of whatever image you're working with. And no one ever complained. Like, no one said, hey, this reads exactly the verse the way I was taught. Um, and again, they just, you know, they just keep growing. Here you have a basically um, an accurate base map because it's Earth. It's underneath this uh, stylized view of the Gettysburg Theater uh, is uh, geospatial uh, information, but it's been uh, highly distorted, so that's sort of what that means. And then these things are just telling you, again, you're using, you're using icons, you're using text, you're using color-coded systems, relational devices, all to basically uh, generate this. And sometimes it's a real pain because there'll be some little notation like way off in one field and we have to add another icon because it's there. You see the network? There's a network in here, so that's why I got that. Um, uh, and this is sort of a very kind of classical one where you have a real, um, a real again, geospatial base map, but really what you're using is a relational, it's, it's constructed by a relational um, uh, influence. Uh, one last thing, so the last thing you have to know about the system. Uh, but the last thing is that when they're connected, of course, they form a language. So just as we connect letters and we form a word, as soon as you mate two of these symbols, then it has a locked-in meaning. So 
this means that. It just basically means that you have a, a geospatial um, material that's been divided into sort of a hypothetical relational matrix. Really useful for subway maps. And, I, mean, I mean, half the information graphics that we do mapping is sort of this, this model. So you can see then if, if people are trying to sort of organize all these images, they, they can do it. You know, they can say, oh, this is one of these. You know? And when I get to the um, subway maps, you'll see uh, that uh, there is a real similitude of shapes and colors and things like that. Uh, again, uh, the, the main point for me is that we went through and we found fifth, like a gold standard. We started with thousands of images and then came down to our little gold standard of, of 50 that we used to sort of discuss the system. This is actually a piece of student work. Um, again, it has a, a geographic base map way back there, but it's invisible. What the dotted line means. It means you really can't see what this is. It's invisible, but it's there. Um, and this is kind of a fun one because this is typography in a quantitative system. So you're getting it already, right? You're like, oh no, I'm learning another language. Um, but what this is actually, and also we've got this little line which is in red, which means there's a color coding system there as well. And what this, um, this is done by uh, Stefan Neck, he's a current student, senior. At Parsons, I thought it was such a nice clean image. I replaced the other word maps we were using with this one. And it's, it's basically birth and death uh, in the various countries. So you see the birth rate is in green uh, and um, the mortality rate is in red. And it's amazing, right? Like you can actually see Africa there massively in the map, expanding on the map. Uh, you can see Russia um, basically losing population. Um, and you see um, some growth you know, here in uh, uh, South America. The United States is growing, sort of steady growth pattern there. Uh, Europe is sort of on the decline. So it's a, a very rapid way, of course, to understand a tremendous amount of information. And that's really the point. The beauty for us is, um, for me, working with students, is I can just say, bring in five schematics next week. Go, you know, go look at the data and start to look and think of these different base maps. Bring me a set of schematics, just sketch this out. And again, now within um, weeks, they start to like, think this way. It's very, very exciting. Uh, so again, you're gonna just flip through a couple of these subway maps. And you'll see there's a similitude in, in how they're, in, in what, the, oh, okay, oh, we have a break. Oh, we have a break. Okay, so um, this goes back to what I also like to discuss, this line, right? the line that roars. And the line that roars is very critical in its length. And uh, I was sort of considering, and I guess I think this deals mostly with, with English, but uh, back in, I don't know, 1980 or so, I, I got a, a collotype copy of some of um, uh, Campion's, I think Campion's, uh, poetry. And I began to sort of try to decipher the magnifying glass you know, it is amazing that when we look at old manuscripts, how small people wrote. You know, it's, it's incredible, the, the quality of writing. I'm sort of convinced that every time you get a pair of glasses, your eyes get worse, basically, right? Because it's like saying, look, it, you don't really feel good, don't exercise, just lie on this softer couch, you know? So, um, you know, because I'm looking at all these, these diagrams from the 16th uh, and 17th century, and this, this tiny, really crafted... Um, writing and uh, typography, but this writing was cramped and very difficult to read, so what I started to do, there was a typewriter at uh, Cooper Union that we could use, an old IBM Selectric, and I took the IBM and started to sort of organize um, the manuscripts, and then what I would do, actually what I did with most of them, I threw them away, right, because I finished, I was done, and then I threw away another one, not knowing that like in 50 years they could actually be valuable because no one knew what a typewriter would be. But, you know, you tend to think you live in the age that might, you know, remain somewhat stable. <clears throat> and then, or what I would do is I would sort of fold them up and connect them to other ones. So, um, this is Sonnet 1. And basically, I began to be fascinated uh, then by the iambic pentameter. So, we all, we all have that kind of back in our brain someplace. But, you know, it's three quatrains, right, and the couplet. So, four lines, four lines, four lines, and two lines. Uh, and then the rhyming schemes can vary, but they all have ten syllables. And that's what I began to find recently, not then, but I began to find that this ten syllable system is a really beautiful line length. Um, it's very effective. Uh, you, you have two though. You have a, uh, English being composed of both the, uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon 
and the Latinate, you have this sort of wonderful mood of these multiple syllable words and these nice single syllable words. Right? So I'm, I'm going to give you a really long line. Um, this line occurs in uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, which I know you guys were wanted to have me read a chunk of that tonight, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that because of our time constraint. Okay? I have to keep this to one hour uh, per slide. So, uh, but this is this amazing line, very, very Anglo-Saxon in its quality, uh, ten syllables. <clears throat> it's from um, Paradise Lost, Book Two, line six twenty-one, and he's he's sort of basically saying things are pretty depressing here. You know, this is the, the sort of the bad angels have been kicked out of hell, <clears throat> and they're sort of looking around saying, "This is not good real estate." But this is the last line here: rocks. Caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death. That's ten syllables. It sounds like a book, right? It's, um, so I gave it a score of 90. Uh, and so I developed a scoring system. Or you could have very, very <laughs> rapid things. In, in, uh, in Campion's uh, book, uh, Campion's poem, he has one that says, I wonder why the sun consumes itself. So look at that, you know, how fast it is. I wonder why the sun consumes itself to rocks, caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death. So I've resorted to develop a system that seems to work that if you have uh, Anglo-Saxon words, short, single-syllable words, then um, ten syllables is a, is a nice, long, solid line. And if you have Latinate words, therefore scholarly papers, the line's too short. It beats too quick. Its measure doesn't work very well. So I was trying to look at sort of the range that I think is more effective in better communication between this sort of the nature of reading. And that ties really nicely back to Campion because Campion was a madman about timing. His sonnets were designed so that every line kind of read the same length. And as I began to sort of decipher and work on them, I didn't do a very good job 20 years ago. I'm getting a little better now. But um, this is number one, and he's basically saying, I you kind of picture two people in a bar together, right? And one guy says to another, you know, what does she look like? You know, give me her measure. And, and the person says, you know, I am just totally in love with her, and I'm not going to tell you her measurement because I, I can't. She's unmeasurable by man, right? So that's kind of the logic. Am I to give you the measure of her with my crooked lines, rough bound and poor marked? Through these shattered sticks all snarled and slur by reason false ruled and vision half darked? He who rules... He only could draft that line, quilting her flesh through vouchsafed measures, stretching full-lengthed his impregnate vine, cross lip, cross toe, cross all curving treasures. Fetch me his sapphired compass, bequeath that golden rod that measured her with light. Steal away his diamond trumpet, whose breath blew measured notes that birthed her from womb's night. Yardsticks of heaven, they best measure she. I'll measure not, though please, she'd measure me. 42 letters on average per line. It's perfect, right? And it has the same sort of beat. <laughs> so this is sort of me trying to figure out. And then there's nice little systems of the, the dark green. is really hard for me to decipher this. I'm probably wrong. So I did a kind of a system of, I thought, the quality of deciphering. And then it even coded to OK to decipher, difficult to decipher, very difficult to decipher. And that's the color coding and the tabs, right? This is what you do when you're in a Cooper Union with your spare time, right? <laughs> um, you know, there's deadlines, there's stuff to do, but you're like, no, no, I'm just going to rule this out, you know? I'm just going to get this right because in 40 years, I'm going to show people this. So here, uh, again, you see the mapping kind of quality, how that's, how that's working through the system. And, uh, you know, you see that same kind of quality as the, this little icon here and the blacks and the reds. And basically... That's what contemporary, so that's what the London Underground looks like. That's what these maps look like. Um, this is a special category uh, because it's, uh, this expert thing indicates this geospatial pictorial. So this is satellite imagery. So they had to have this special category, which I really shouldn't have here because it kind of makes you all say, well, wait a minute, your taxonomy doesn't work if you have to add something else. And I said, no, this is just a sub-ontology. It's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so here, very simple, just page, I mean, satellite image with a, uh, with a road on top. Yes, it's, it's the hybrid imagery. There they are. That's a hybrid 
map satellite image. Every time you take out your iPhone, hit hybrid, they should just show you this and you know what would be going on. You wouldn't have to look at the map anymore. Um, uh, same thing, uh, but here there's also quantitative devices and stuff like that. Again, there's a lot, there's a lot of satellite imagery, so those, I, um, this is actually a little preview. I, um, I, I just had the honor uh, of doing the, uh, the cover for the Parsons Red, their alumni magazine. So their topic was play, which is tricky because uh, the current dean doesn't really think of art as play, right? He thinks it's a you know, sort of it's a pretty serious business, right? But what, um, this is connected dots, by the way, because the geospace is invisible, so it's kind of neat that way. But basically what happens here is um, when you, when you uh, if any of you from Parsons get your alumni magazine, the dots are in the same place, but how you connect the dots, uh, how you, I mean, excuse me, the spheres are in the same place. The big dots, the ellipses, the black ellipsoidal things are in the same place, front and back of the publication, but just by moving around the connected dot configuration, it creates two totally different things. So that was really fun to do. I wanted to show it tonight, but it's not published yet, so they said, bug off. Um, well, it's pretty obvious, right? You've seen that one in the quantitative with the um, iconographic elements placed on top. So basically, that's your standard everyday uh, XY coordinate. Yes, this is serious business, it's science, and we're sure it's right. Because that's also <laughs> part of the idea, of course, is there is a difference between precision and accuracy, right? And that's, sometimes that's mixed up. I use it all the time. You know, I tell people, I'll be there at you know, 2.34 in the afternoon. They're like, wow, this guy's so great, so accurate. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm late. So just, once you say that, you've got it. Um, this one, another quantitative one. This is kind of neat because there's a color coding to the, to the devices, but... By the way, this is, um, I don't know how many of you have to do a lot of graphing work, but this is quite a nice discovery that you know, typically you have your points and you connect all your points. So basically, your points only take up a small amount of space. And the, the nodes, basically, the links are sort of running from point to point. But we reverse the logic here where the point actually takes up as much space as possible and the link is just as quick as possible getting to its next, um, kind of, kind of to its next vector. And we found that you could almost, you could have like 50 or 60 lines and people could follow them. Whereas the standard dot line thing, maybe 10, 11, people can't read many more. So just by sort of rethinking uh, something as simple as connecting dots, uh, we were able to f get more graphically powerful uh, and informative visualization. I love this thing, it's from the Works Progress Administration. Um, I guess it really the, the last major, major like, um, uh, progressive push in this country, which we've now in our next one, but they won't do the stamps like this anymore. Um, but this is, I think, tremendous fun because a very simple device that has a quantitative you know, clock on the base here that is supported through the iconography, which tells you really what time is, um, which is further supported by this you know, block of text uh, and, uh, and logo. So, very simple device. That would have been a two-part two part rubber stamp? Uh, yes, yeah, just, you just spin the outside and stamp it down. But beautiful. I mean, look how much that's informing stuff. In such, it's, it's just a brilliantly simple system. I, I just love it. Uh, go on, you don't have to... Oh, uh, another poem. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is his third uh, poem, which is called... Um, well, actually, most of them don't have, have titles. But, um, you know, the classic thing is to use the first line. And what's interesting is you can find this one published... But the line here is different in the published version. This line was different. Uh, again, this is done in old IBM Selectric. And you know, just, you, know, you look at it now and you think, wow, I never do that. You know, just, you know, I just process it with OCR or something. But um, it's quite lovely. And this is basically just saying, um, look, I'm really having a hard time getting to know her. And if you could just cast a spell on her, that would be really good. Just <laughs> speed the whole thing up. So basically, it just tells the fairies, like, come on, get rid of your, like, fairy duties and get to work here for me. Thrice toss these oaken ashes in the air, and thrice three times tie up this true love's knot. Thrice sit you down in this enchanted chair, and murmur soft, she will, or she will not. Go burn those poisonous weeds in off-blue fire, this cypress gathered at a dead man's grave, these screech owl's feathers in this prickling briar, that all I fears and cares an end may have. 
Then come, you fairies, dance with me around. Strew your deft enchantment through wood and lawn. Melt her hard heart with your melodious sound. Turn her fair face that I may gaze thereon. In vain are all the charms I can devise. She hath an art to break them with her eyes. This is called, this, this is Ben Schneiderman's invention uh, using algorithms to create what he called tree maps. Um, I love Ben Schneiderman, but I think it's a really dumb name because, you know, tree map to me sort of would indicate branches coming out and finding a way into a central position. This almost does the reverse brilliantly. It respaces everything by the available quantity. So you can see how, you know, moving sort of from the printed work, a lot of pieces I showed were printed. Now this is a screen capture, right, working in screen work. And you can see how the thinking begins to really change because in print work, you generally have some sense of border. Um, and here you, you, know, you can fill your whole space up, every available pixel is being used uh, in some informative way. So again, this, these are sort of the, the switches that are happening. Typography has a real challenge in this, in this medium. It's not, typography does not want to do this, right? It doesn't really like doing stuff like this. You know, it's being forced into different sizes uh, as well, not only by the sizes given, but the fact the long word just has to get smaller. So actually, in some ways, the typography is misinforming a little, because a long title will just get smaller, even on a larger field, and a small title will get larger. So that alone makes this a little misinformative. But they work pretty good in, in terms of speed and, and a lot of data sort of coming at you at once. Um, here, here's another one. Right? So again, what you have basically is a quantitatively controlled relational space. That's what that means. So when you see that, it means word map. It always means that. Um, so that's sort of where we're going with that. Um, this is the way we started drawing our pie charts. We found that pie charts drawn by uh, proportion of the pie were far less easily read than pie charts uh, shown by how far the pi equal pies uh, go out. Because right away you understand how many categories you're working with, and then you can look at the volume of the categories. These are particularly complex ones because they have three levels of data. But you know, in the, in the simpler form, you wouldn't always have grades. But the point is, you know, just opening the pie size up was more rapidly understandable. Uh, when you're dealing with volume, maybe if you're strictly with percentile, you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, stack graphs, you know, very, they're fun and, and they're sort of rapidly informative. But most of these things, when you have to really know something, you have to go back to typography again. Uh, and I think that is something that we can all enjoy the truth of. Um, Good old periodic table of elements. Lots of stuff supported by a simple relational uh, underpinning. So it basically says there's cells here, you know, and the cells have type and type and, and logos and, and letters and things like that. Uh, another one, basically a series of cells, um, and the cells are being supported by icons which are, which are mated to numbers. So... Um, this is an old piece done by Spire Integrated Design. Ms. Su Chong's here tonight, too. And she spent, like, just hours and hours working on these nasty interfaces, you know, and, uh, and also in a time when it wasn't like Flash. You know, these things took many, many hours to create and draw when you're building these models. But uh, another beauty of using the system is the ability to create very fast front-end prototypes. So this whole idea of front-end prototyping has become very powerful in, uh, in government and other types of design. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. You've got a relational system. Uh, when you cut your quills, Ina, they don't line up like this, do they? No, they roll around and you know, they don't do this. Exactly. But this is, isn't this nice? Um, this is the way it should be. Right? All your quills should line up for their circumcision without any question. But um, basically, you've got a nice relational system there. And it's being supported by an image, which is kind of interesting, uh, and, and the iconography above it. Numbers are actually icons because they're not phonetic devices, right? They're icon iconographic uh, devices. But uh, lots of these we had, we found. You know, and the point was that we'd be sent images and they'd say, does this break your system? Does this break your system? Does this break your system? And the, the killer were these things because every time something came in, if we were going to make a change to the language, we had to go through all 300 images again to make sure the language was consistent. So the language is, is fun in its own right. Here you have a, a relational imagery, right? Like the thing is it's, it's bound together. Um, so uh, 
uh, when Davinsky was you know, drawing us, everything has a value and it happens to be you know, image as well. A lot of ancient information design involves natural form. We don't do that much anymore, but uh, if you go, for example, um, if you look at Egyptian uh, sculpture, Egyptian um, statues, and I forget the name of the one goddess, but she's, she has a very square head, a very uh, uh, elongated head, and her ears, it looks sort of like little twisty, like almost um, uh, funnels are coming out of her ears, and a very straight neck, you know? So you look at that and you say, wow, interesting goddess, and what she did is she protected women and children. Uh, and as you study and you look at it, you realize it's a female uterus. Her head is shaped uh, like a uterus with the side and the birth canal. And you say, oh, that's brilliant, right? It's a three-dimensional one of these. It's both informative uh, from a representation of uh, human form. She's a goddess. But it also uh, is informative in terms of its function. So we don't create stuff like that so much. Um, uh, uh, Minard here is uh, very famous. Uh, his, his, his work as an engineer, uh, really one of the fathers of information design, uh, the one that you know, Tufti uh, celebrates so much. In fact, the Napoleon's March is the last one we're going to see here. And again, you have geospace at the base of this thing, that's very distorted geospace. But there's a really neat thing going on. Uh, there are quantitative nodes. So these nodes, uh, excuse me, links, these links have widths which determine their values. So that's what this sort of means. This little yellow-red combination is when you have links that have quantitative values. And um, the test after, after is not too hard. I've only got 50 of these things to, for you guys to go through, right? That's a fractal. Don't ask me why. Lots of arguments. Arno almost killed me. I went out um, because I ran away. But that's what this means. This means fractal. Um, okay. Now, this one was particularly interesting because I was always trying to get this scoring thing going um, with Campion, right? So, this was probably in the early 80s now, and, and uh, I've, you know, everything's shot in my life. I'm deeply in debt, and, you know, this is what I'm doing uh, late at night. Uh, so, again, this, and this system has another kind of scoring system, but when I had read, uh, Campion wrote uh, a theory in uh, 1597 called Observations on the Art of English Posy. And in that, very quickly written theories, like 12 pages, but it's brilliant. And in it, he, he begins to speak about the, the use of English and trying to create rhyme, not through um, sound, but through length. And how he felt that there were these perfect lengths. And again, they all come out around 45, 46, 47 characters to the line. Um, but it varies, and what happens is, again, if you have sort of the Latinate language with the faster beat-moving syllables, the multiple words, versus the Anglo-Saxon sort of more um, digital kind of um, status type of words, he would actually change the beat to accommodate that, which I've begun to discover in, in reading some of, some of these through. Basically, in this one, he's saying, she has really beautiful ears, and I'd like to kiss them. Uh, and, and everyone's kissing her ears but me, so that seems rather unfair. <laughs> Search ocean's coast for undiscovered beach. There seek with care a shell, fine form and bright. Shell kiss neath waves and smoothed by ocean speech. Shell kiss through morns and secreted each night. Raise that shell aloft, hold it in the air. There are kissed by bombed winds, easing dark's travail. There are kissed by rising sun, Warming and fair, last kiss by starred sphere, passioned in hail. Now place that shell and palm of infant hold, thus kissed by purest smile of sparkling eyes, thus kissed by fingers wrapped round shell's fine fold, thus kissed by honeyed mouth and tender sighs. That shell's her ear, all kissed by earth's soft things, yet still unkissed by me how hard that stings. And Jaguar, uh, wiring diagram, right? So now here's, here's a really quite a fascinating one because you actually, I spoke in the beginning, I said you generally only have one base map because that's, as humans, I should have mentioned this a long time ago, right? But as humans, we can read through all these layers. That's what we discovered. If you have one base map, you can pile 15 layers and we'll sort of read through and navigate away. 
it's really hard to have two base maps. When you have two, it just falls apart. It's very difficult to decipher. And the only exception is when you put a base map on type of a first base map because the first base map is hard to figure out. So in this case, <laughs> what's happening is a relational base map, right? All those nodes and links are just uh, are done through the lo oh, it doesn't work, does it? Uh, <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Can't do that. You know, it's like the blackboard technology, right? No, you you okay. So well, um you know, life's a bitch, isn't it? Uh, so what happens is the, the nodes and the links uh, are organized, of course, just because there's space for them. But then on top of that, there's just a grid place. And the grid is placed so that we can just find stuff. So basically, that kind of idea where you have a map and you have a grid on top of the map, like in a subway map, A1 or B2, that's when it makes sense. And these are about the only two that really share a nice affinity. Well, actually, I mean, this one, this system, which basically identifies another system. So this was a problem, too. It was a long discussion, like, what do we do now? Because we made this statement. But as Arno pointed out to me, just because you made a statement doesn't mean it's true. Okay. Um, that's actually the funniest thing I said today, but nonetheless. Uh, so, I forgot why there's no line here now. I don't know, there's some reason. But um, this is also a, a node and link, um, but it's been highly distorted. The, the, the nodes and links have been pushed into another relational system. Very weird image. But, you know, we, I'm sitting there looking at these images. And the point, again, was, can they break the system and get their money back, right? And we're like, no, no, they can't break the system. So, um, I try. Okay, so sorry, we're starting to move into typography now. Again, you see the same thing. You see sort of a relational system of these characters and the characters themselves. Again, these are they're weird ones because we purposely were trying to do ones you don't normally see or use. 95% can be handled with, like, two icons, but a lot of them uh, cannot. Here, another. This is a relational map. Uh, and some people know uh, Wattenberg's work, incredible stuff. Uh, and here, there's a, this sort of relational, again, this is that node, you know, the, the, excuse me, the links. And the links have quantitative values. And the links are going to a point along a relational scale. So that's what that means. Uh, the relational scale is technically invisible, but it becomes visible because there's so much data on top of it. Just like with the word map, right? If I have enough locations on top of an invisible map, the map begins to become apparent by the arrangement. Oh, finally, a simple one, a logo. So, um, and this, is, uh, this, this uh, logo basically, again, how does it work, right? It does have some intrinsic meaning, right? Some intrinsic semiotic meaning. But most of its meaning is through advertising and promotion. The, the, it's the knowledge of this thing is taught and trained to you. And that's how all the unconstrained ones kind of work. The unconstrained ones take training to understand. Whereas the constrained ones have inherent uh, meaning. I just, I always have to use these things. You know, just, yeah, I just like them. Um, all right, so then we start to move into uh, typography a little more. So now we're in the last sort of section here. Um, 49, 39, so I'm doing okay. Uh, but... Basically what happens is, what do we do with these lines, right? We, if we can get them the right measure, it's great. And that's, you know, the point, I think, that you'll find, if you take any of Shakespeare's sonnets and just draw a line, sort of that average line count line, you'll find these wonderful sort of values. And I think it's a great way to uh, begin to think of a column width in, in classical sort of book typography. But also, uh, in terms of now, we're trying to use more and more type, of course, obviously in the, in the newer... Um, and the new arrangements, doing things in the web, uh, and I'm finding that those values are really effective as well. So that's kind of exciting. That there's this ionic pentameter, right? The, the double beat, you know, the Greek thing, right? So foot, 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 ionic pentameter, five times two. And that beat is so effective, except interesting, when you again move into the, uh, into the Latinate, you sort of have to stretch it a bit because of the quicker musicality. Um, so here's what happens, right? Number one, um, the letter forms are in some sort of order, right? You've, you've got this sort of organized system, and um, you have to put that in a relational diagram. So, in a way, the grid is your relational diagram. And what's quite fascinating, going kind of back and looking back to this whole system, printers figured all this stuff out, right? I mean, they had this amazing aspect of interrelationship between the line and the relationable space. And I think it's one of the most complex to really use and get right. 
and yet it's probably the one we've been working on and perfecting for the longest uh, time. Uh, also with uh, Chinese characters. So here we're dealing, the difference you can see um, is just here, right? Because you're dealing with the pictograph. So the pictograph gives you the um, low relational because each of these carry meaning uh, where they are. But otherwise you can see, you know, this is, this is oops, sorry. This is, um, you know, Western and Eastern uh, typography. Uh, and then here there's other things, again, like, this is just because someone wants to mess this up. Says, oh, what about this image? Oh. So then you have a little color-coded type so that's coming in there. Um, you've got your relational system, which is invisible. You've got your type. Um, and, and basically, again, uh, very simple, right? The division of space here. But you also have color coding and, and uh, in it, so that's thrown in there. Uh, Korean, uh, old Korean, uh, ancient Korean, uh, gives you the problem, or the uh, like, like hieroglyphics, really, they have both phonetics and images, so that's why you've got the double. So the old Korean has, has the double. But it's the same problem, you know, east, west, you've got essentially a, a base map, a relational base map, um, support, supporting a line. The map is supporting a line, and the line is supporting the stuff you're talking about. So it's really three levels, right? In some ways, when I teach typography now, I talk about a line, and I just draw a line. So that's what we're going to study for three weeks, this line. When do you break the line? When is there a punctuation in the line? When do you begin to you know, uh, move the line? When do you have emphasis in the line? So um, in a sense, this is still, that would be an invisible page all planned out, and these are the symbols that make it a reality. Uh, oh, another, another sonnet. Okay, so I mean, this is an IBM Selectric, right? So you turn it 13 degrees, and you sort of uh, do all this. And then um, the concept here was I thought if we could just radiate these distances, I could draw circles through all the poems, through Shakespeare's work and stuff, just draw circles around it, and then figure out these line lengths. So here's the line over here, that wonderful line, right? Um, that one by um, John Milton. I know when you pause that long, you're supposed to take a quick drink of water. Uh, and I forgot to do that, right? Because when you, when, you, when you forget something, then you pick up the, the thing and you, and you, like, you train your mind. So, good. All right, so, um, so this was, uh, at that time, I've learned a little more now, but that time I felt like 45 to 90 was the longest uh, I could find, and the shortest I could find, of iambic pentameter of, of a ten-syllable line. But it's so great. It just works. These ten-syllable lines give you this wonderful reading. So I've been taking white papers and scholarly stuff and children's stuff and seeing how they can work from point to point. It's pretty effective. Because, um, okay, well, let me not, I mean, I've said that like nine times now, right? So, um, so here we are again. Rocks, caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death. 90. Um, and where's my shortest one here? Uh, well, I'll read it, and then you tell me. Uh, here. So in this one, he's saying, you know, kissing is, so it's, he's gotten past the normal sonnet structure, right? Because really when you look at uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, you know, young men go in and find, I'm going to find a really beautiful sonnet to read to my girlfriend. I mean, they're all awful for that, most of them. Right? I mean, Shakespeare's sonnets, except for maybe 18, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Is that it? Um, but... Most of them, you know, she's got wire hair, she's, like, making love to everyone else, and, and basically he says, you know, you make love to all these people, now it makes me want you more, and we both lie together, and we lie together, but we lie about each other. You know, most of the poems, Shakespeare basically turned the sonnet on his head. He, uh, she, you know, she's not this pure, unobtainable woman. And, you know, of course there's an the argument about homosexuality in it, but in some ways, if you can read it, in some ways it's just really the man to the woman, the woman to the man as well. Um, but Campion is really just full of passion. C.S. Lewis said that he didn't find Campion's work passionate because Campion used it all up in the poem, and there was none left for the reader. So I like that. You know, I love that. He's like, he used it all for himself. He doesn't even care about you anymore. And, and this is probably about 1619. Uh, so at some point, the, the sonnet starts to turn, and she's not as unobtainable uh, as one would expect in sonnet form. So Campion also turned the sonnet on his head as well. And this one he's saying, your kisses are great, but I can't store them up. 
When you go away, I don't have any left. So can we work that out? Uh, Thick as summer stars are thy kisses fair, sown and reaped by I, by you reaped and sown. Unsprung full from earth, water, sun, and air, and from seeded kiss, multitudes have grown. But where is the harvest, dear, to fill my barn? Unstore the stores of your bounty flowing. Though I be deep in kisses and thy charm, I cannot upgather what I am knowing. Your kiss does overfill my loft and grange, fruit so copious. Unto roof line stark, but pause your planting, and the fruit turns strange. All's barren, earthless, airless, dry, and dark. Is love so forgetful of future needs that first it starves and then it overfeeds? There's one more which isn't in the four pauses, it's what I call the fifth pause. And um, it's a nice one that I'd like you to hear because it's very beautiful. And this one, um, clearly he must be losing her by this point and has to put all the energy into it. And basically, he says, look at, um, just go wherever you go, do whatever you do, I'll just wait for you at the end. I'll be there at the end for you. So this is very beautiful. It always makes, well, it doesn't always, but 92.46% of the time, um, it makes women cry. Uh, so it's, it's good. It's, it's, anyhow. Where is that place that you should last come to? Afore I'll go and build a garden fair. Meanwhile, I'll pursue the things that you'll pursue, while I, through calm or storm, await you there. Through joyful toil, that garden I'll be fined, improved through age, aging without complaint. With nature's bones, I'll mingle acts of mine to lay their textures deep and colors faint. Emboldened thus, I'll make this bold-faced claim that when arrived, you'll know to call my name. And there neath bower, freed of prior trials, I'll dry hard tears and softly wet your smiles. For there there'll be no evil thing empowered, only me, our love, and thee, and flowered. Very different beat. Very um, Latinate. So it's longer, it's drawn out, it's more moody. Uh, unlike the others that are much faster and more aggressive. So um, the pacing of the lines change, even though it's still tensile. I thought I should do something specifically about typography, so uh, here's a little type specimen sheet. So now that covers me, right? Um, but uh, very simple, you know, this organization of, of letter forms. So uh, I think I just put that in because I liked it, you know, and I, I thought the government should have something like that. Uh, and this is the other super... Um, uh, super system because it's binary code. So binary code is just like geospace. It, there's sort of like opposite of the whole. An image of the Earth has the same kind of precision as binary uh, code. So it's kind of neat. And this is from, of course, the icon iconographic uh, idea. So that's simple. And then here, uh, these get into um, uh, three-dimensional forms when they're shown as 2D. Uh, so you have this sort of, the same sort of idea at the quantitative level. So again, signal-generated quantitative imagery, right? So all the ones with the double circles are signal-generated. They're totally objective visualizations. Uh, and some of them are just, you know, beautiful. Um, this is music. Actually, this is um, uh, relationships in the Bible, word relationships in the Bible. So incredible uh, work, and it is done with algorithms, so it has that space. Um, this one is in the form of student as well, but just lots of layers, lots of information. But again, it gets back to that subway map kind of thing, where you have where you're taking space and you're and you're pushing it into relational areas, and then it's being overridden with other pictures, other icons. The you know this one by now, right? The quantitative uh, uh, links, uh, and then finally icons on top of that, and text on top of that. So. Um, and these are just ones that, you know, we, we took these just to see if we could break the system. But the system is very good to us and, uh, and doesn't break so much. These are, are great. Um, it's by a Japanese designer. And he actually distorts geospace quantitatively. So this is actually a, 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 a train map out of Tokyo. And the distance is he's taken the geospace and stretched them to match the time. So basically you have a quantitative 
distances, but it's a real geospace. So it's kind of flipped on its head, where the, um, where the distances are stretching space. Uh, so kind of a, a very a unique one, but again, uh, very powerful, very communicative. And again, we can, you know, when I'm showing this to students, they get this very fast, and they're able to think, you know, instead of this, which becomes, um, I think, you know, when Tufti spoke about many of these things, he does it from kind of a critique-based model, right? He says, here's a problem, here's how it's solved. Uh, what we tried to do was make that actionable, see if we could actually come up with a system where if you weren't really trained as a designer with that type of critique basis, you would be able to, um, uh, you know, create these things. Um, this, is, uh, this is a flight of a bat. You can kind of see the bat, but there's no picture of a bat. It was all rendered by signal. So it's a signal rendering of a bat in flight. Uh, quite beautiful, right? So it's got actually really interesting because it's both relational um, on both levels, so it's kind of neat. Uh, and this is the famous, uh, famous map that uh, Tufta uses, Charles Moore. And in this case, you have um, uh, Napoleon uh, marching into Moscow, and this is, again, our quantitative link, and these are his soldiers dying of cold uh, as they march in and come back. Uh, we presented this in Washington, um, a room just filled with PhD people. It was amazing, right? It's like, it's just, wow. Right? You walk in, and you sort of go through this whole thing. You have to justify your, your white papers. And when I you know, left school, I always thought, I'm going to make, I, I think design is amazing, incredibly amazing. You know, people say to me, well, you know, I was in graphic design, but I, I, I really thought I should do something, you know, important, you know? I'm like, what do you mean? Nothing could be more important than shaping communication so people do the right thing or whatever they want to do. Um, but in, in some ways, I just felt we're sort of like the gold traders of knowledge. You know, like we make money coming or going. It doesn't matter if the gold goes up in value or down in value. But what we're trying to do is create a way to um, link, you know, intelligence. And of course, you know, you can have fun. I mean, um, I think enjoying what we do is sort of quite legitimate. But in other ways, one of my goals was always to find deeper and deeper and deeper meanings uh, in what we did. And um, so, you know, to be in front of a room of just pure uh, uh, scientists at the National Academy and doing this was very funny, you know, because I said, gosh, you know, it, it kind of worked. Now, now what do I do? You know, so I went back to my poetry. But uh, one of the, of the people in the audience said, oh, you made, which is interesting, right? She raised her hand and she said, oh, you made an error in this because um, your quantitative device should be on the bottom, not the top. Like, whoa, these people are paying attention, right? But it's actually not time-based, right? Like, you generally think the x-axis is time-based, but it's actually a map. You can even see little rivers running through. This is actually a map, right? So the base of this thing is geography, not time, which, again, is how we were able to justify what we're trying to do because um, with this type of intelligence, then, we've been able to map out some pretty interesting um, scenarios.